Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining me again. Uh, my name is Evan Radisic. I am the Executive Director of the Cloud Software Association. Uh, thanks for joining us for another masterclass. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Rajiv Nathan um, from Startup Hype Man. He's been in this world of um, pitch decks, presentations uh, for, for quite a while and kind of developed quite an expertise around it. And I know there's a lot out there for this stuff, uh, but we thought, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff out there, but there's also not much that's specific to partners. So we thought we'd bring him in, uh, kind of get in there and talk about some of the strategies that he, he kind of employs, but we'll try to have this kind of partner hat uh, on. So I won't take up much of the time. Uh, we've, got, we've got an hour, just under an hour, uh, jumping with questions, all that kind of stuff as awkwardly as, as you can. And uh, we'll try to get through as much as we can. So uh, Rajiv, it's, uh, here you go. Appreciate it, Evan. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Those of you who have just hopped in, if you could do me a favor and just in the chat, type in uh, what company you're at and your role or your function at the company. Um, and sort of as Evan said, so I've got a lot of expertise in presentation development and, and kind of like the art of persuasion through presentations and pitching and everything like that. Um, the majority of my work is focused on working with companies in a kind of direct to customer pitching and selling environment. However, what you'll notice is a lot of that can be mirrored in the partner selling environment as well, because at the end of the day, it's just, it's an audience that you're having to persuade, right? And so it's, it's just, how do you modify it for that audience? And so I'll talk through all of this um, and I'll do my best to make sure that it is relevant to the partner crowd, but I want you to see how this kind of applies to not only your partner situations, but really any situation, whether it's direct to a customer, whether it's a partner, whether it's some type of like third party stakeholder who you need to convince, um, how, this, how this methodology we're gonna go through um, really covers that. And, um, and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into my background in, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes here, but I want to, um, I want to kick off by just diving right into a story. So let me get my slides pulled together. And is this filling up your entire screen or is it only like part of your screen? Entire uh, screen. Okay, because I, I don't have it on full your, screen. Your mugshot in, in the presentation. Okay, great. I don't have it on full screen on my side. So I just want to make sure that it actually broadcasts in full screen for you. Okay, sweet. So. I call this uh, how to create the perfect partner pitch deck, or I mean, really what I like to call it is presentations that don't suck. Uh, Cause that's what I think we're all trying to do at the end of the day is build things that don't suck and, and win people over. And I want to start by sharing a story that was really, uh, I think back to it, this was several years ago and it was like, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Um, I was working at a digital product agency and my team had an opportunity to pitch a major, major, major entertainment brand. Um, and when I say major, like, trust me, you've heard of them. You've seen their entertainment properties before. They're, you've consumed their content before. And they've, they've produced some of the most popular uh, TV shows in America. And they came to us because they wanted to build out this gamified digital loyalty program for their number one show. Um, due to a lifetime uh, NDA, I'm not allowed to say who it was in a public setting. But if you ever um, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me, I can tell you what their name rhymes with. <laughs> um, but just trust me when I say you've seen the show before and you've definitely watched other shows from this entertainment brand before. Um, and this deal would have been like massive for our company. Um, it would have been so big that had we won, I just want to confirm, uh, cause I dragged another window in front of me. Did half the slide get covered or you still, you can still see. It definitely did get covered. It did. Okay. All right. Let me feed that. It just would just like a great box, but yeah, it's really weird. It's like, I got my like, you know the presenter view where I can see what slide is next? Uh, I think you have for to some share reason that, full screen for that to work without the box. All right, I'll just toss it over to my other screen then. Um, so in any case, uh, this would have been the biggest deal our company ever won. Like it would have been $10 million plus per year. And I actually remember my manager telling me beforehand hey, if we win this, we're going to have to talk about like restructuring your comp plan because you would actually not have to work another day the rest of the year uh, because, the, because of the way the commission structure was. So it was like this massive opportunity. I was running lead on it and we had spent dozens of hours coming up with the perfect strategy. We had meticulously crafted the deck. We knew we were competing against uh, two other like finalists in this case. And we were getting input from our different team members and different departments to like deliver this strategy to them. And we made sure the whole presentation was beautifully designed. 
And we actually flew myself and three other people from uh, my team to their headquarters on the West Coast for a live in-person presentation. And it was a pretty surreal setting because I found myself sitting across the table from the executive producer of one of the most popular TV shows of all time. Like this, this person's name is the first in the credits when the show ends. That's how like ridiculous this was. And I was, I don't know, like 25 years old at the time, uh, maybe, maybe younger than that. And I could, but I was like pumped for this, right? Like I thought it was our chance to shine. We had this big $10 million annual opportunity in front of us and I could feel all the hard work about to pay off big time. And so we opened up our slide deck and we dove into our presentation. Now, what I would love for you to do is just in the chat here, uh, I'm gonna give you three different options. Did they say one, hey, this is the best presentation we've ever seen. Number two, did they hire us on the spot? Or number three, did they say, hey, this is really good. Let's talk further project scope and details. Or four, sorry, four options. Or four, did they say, get the hell out of here? So one was best presentation I've ever seen. Two, they hired us on the spot. Three, this is good. Let's talk in more detail. Four, get the hell out of here. Use numbers one, two, three, or four. Type it in in the chat there and let me know what you think the answer was. Got a bunch of threes. One, threes. All right, so most of you are saying three, which was um, let's talk more detail. One of you said one, which was best presentation I've ever seen. Uh, surprisingly, the answer was four. <laughs> and they they just laughed us out of the building. They What happened was what I now call, those of you who ever played the video game Mortal Kombat, we had what I now call a sales deck, a pitch deck fatality, where it really felt like they, like this executive producer, like reached into our chest, pulled out our heart and threw it on the table throbbing because he was just tearing us a new one with his feedback. So this meeting started with excitement on both sides and like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes later, we are getting our behinds handed to us. This, this guy is picking apart our presentation, our strategy, our supporting data, our projected impact, and so on and so forth. It really felt like, you know, the business version of playing Mortal Kombat. And then at some point, someone in the corner yells out, finish them. And then, you know, they just, they just destroy us. And ultimately, the meeting ended with a less senior member of their team saying, like walking us to the door and saying, we'll be in touch. And my team, I'll tell you, we left the meeting with our heads down. The ride back to the hotel was total silence. And I could tell how pissed my boss was because whenever she was mad, she would she would get really quiet. And like her way of like coping in the moment would be to just start looking at, through her phone at photos of her kids. And that's exactly what she was doing on the, on the, the Uber ride back. Um, actually, I don't know if Uber was out yet. Uber or taxi ride back, whichever it was. Um, and no one was willing to say out loud, hey, we blew that, but we all just kind of internally knew that we blew it. And then a week later, I got an email from them saying, thanks, but no thanks. And I think back and at the time, I'm like, how could this have happened? Because at worst, we had equal technology compared to our competitors, but at best, to be honest, we had way better technology because we knew. And we had multiple examples of other companies who had success doing the thing we said we were gonna do. And we knew we were more experienced than anyone in the game and our, our solution for them was really damn good. We thought we even made a custom made animated video to explain the whole pitch and drive the point home. So what did we do wrong that it all went downhill so quickly? Well, the answer was it was our presentation, okay? Our first four slides looked something like this. We started off with the NASCAR slide, if you've heard this term before, where we threw a bunch of our customer logos on the slide and said, this is why we're awesome. This is who works with us, like a NASCAR rider on the track. You see a bunch of logos on it. Then we hit the proven solution slide where we talked about our platform, our product, and how it was you know, the best in the industry. And we used all the buzzwords here, like holistic, data-driven, customer-centric, omni-channel, right? All those things that sound like they mean something and sound impressive. Then we hit the tech stack slide where we talked about, hey, our product is great and it's backed by this 99.99% .99 uptime. We have the perfect API integrations, et cetera, et cetera. And then we hit what I call the suits slide, which is we lined up our executive team, the headshots of them, and we, we put their bios underneath them and, and combined, they had 250 plus years of industry experience. And that's why we were great. And then from there, we had a slide that was like a photo of our headquarters with bullet points of with offices in these seven other locations. 
And then we had a couple of customer case studies. And then we talked about, you know, our strategy and our product for them. Right. And this format was our downfall. And hearing that now, it might seem kind of ridiculous to be like, why would you, why would you pitch that way? But the reality is, is as I have learned and observed, most presentations actually look and sound like this. And, the, and, and that is the downfall of not only our presentation then, but most presentations that I've seen since. And that is the big problem, right? This, that, that format is a total snooze fest. Perhaps when you've been in your partner presentations or even your customer facing presentations, your end customer facing presentations, you've got a presentation that's really like a capabilities deck. And I think we need to throw that concept out the window of a capabilities deck because it is not, it's not the way that's gonna convince people to do business with us or get them excited even. Um, it's a total snooze fest and it shows the buyer that you care about yourself, but you don't necessarily care about them. It shows the partner you care about yourself, but not necessarily care about them. Um, and chances are it looks and sounds exactly like what your competition is doing, which means they've heard it all before and it's not differentiated and they're looking for a pencil to like stab themselves with by slide four. Uh, I heard someone say this once. I wish I could remember who because I would give them attribution for it. But someone once said in the video I saw, it's funny we built things in PowerPoint because most presentations are powerless and they have no point. Um, we try to impress people with all these fancy numbers. Uh, we, talk, we, we talk about, oh, the ROI, the ROI. Oh, look at all this rate of return you're going to get. I, I liken it to, and I'm a big fan of pro wrestling, and I liken it to this wrestler in this interview trying to explain why he's going to win this match against two other guys coming up. You know, they say all men. Is, it, is the audio playing or was it playing just now? Okay, good. Are created equal, but you look at me and you look at small Joe and you can see that statement is not true. See, normally if you go one on one with another wrestler, you got a 50 50 chance of winning. But I'm a genetic freak and I'm not normal. So you got a 25% at best at beating me. And then you add Kurt Angle to the mix, your chances of winning drastically go down. See, the three way at sacrifice, you got a 33 and a third chance of winning. But I, I got a 66 and two thirds chance of winning because Kurt Angle knows he can't beat me and he's not even going to try. So, small Joe, you take your 33 and a third chance minus my 25% chance, and you got an eight and a third chance of winning at sacrifice. But then you take my 75% chance of winning, if we used to go one-on-one, -on -one, and then add 66 and two-thirds percent, I got 141 and two-thirds chance of winning at sacrifice. See, Joe, the numbers don't lie, and they spell disaster for you at sacrifice. Math, that makes no sense, but we're, we shout out a bunch of numbers and we're like, yeah, you're going to get 166 and two thirds percent return on, on your investment if you partner up with us, right? So we got to like cut out that kind of language uh, and get away from like being so numbers and data heavy and really take a whole refined approach to this. And what I would do if I had a do-over, you know, back to that opportunity seven, eight years ago, if I had a do-over. I would have done this. I would have modeled my entire presentation on the Hamilton musical. And if you're like, what the hell are you talking about? Trust me, we're gonna justify why as we get through this presentation today. Um, granted, the musical wasn't out at the time, but if I had a time machine, I would take what I know now, go back in time and update it to follow this sort of plot line and make it viable for them. Um, and my advice to you is to, when you're building out your partner presentations is to do the exact same thing. Because I'll tell you, after that, after I had that experience so many years ago, I kind of made this like vow to myself. I'm like, I got to figure this out because there's got to be a better way, way to do this. And I kind of went on this multi-year exploration looking at different, um, looking at different places where like emotion is drawn out and where there's, uh, where there's persuasion of some kind being done. And through all of that, first-hand research, I found the best model for a presentation is actually in the Hamilton musical. Now, uh, most of you are new to who I am, so let me just do a quick kind of rundown of my personal background. Uh, and I want to just clarify that my core belief in life is the power of having a voice. And I believe that everyone deserves a voice. Now, you got to use your voice responsibly, responsibly, but I believe that everyone deserves a voice. And so that fuels all of my professional and personal and creative pursuits. So if you didn't know, aside from doing stuff like this, I'm also a hip hop artist. 
Um, I am also a yoga instructor. Uh, I am also a professional ring announcer for combat sports. Uh, most recently, um, I have been featured on NBC Sports and some other uh, TV properties. Um, and I, I take this kind of broad background and I apply that to the business world. And that's what I, you know, what I do at Startup Hype Man as the founder and chief pitch artist. Now, if your company itself is not a startup, don't worry. I like to say I work, we work with startups, scale-ups, and grown-ups. And for the grown-ups, we help you get back to thinking like a startup. And all of this applies regardless of the stage of company that you're at. So this is, you know, I take that kind of hybrid background and I look at business through the lens of entertainment. I look at business through the lens of um, where, we, where we combine entertainment with, with marketing, with sales and with psychology, because I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned outside of the business realm. So today, what we're going to cover is how do we build that right partner presentation and the kind of the process or the flow of information for today is I want to first go through why presentations and when to use one. Then I want to cover the mindset around thinking like an entertainer. I want to talk through going ham and using the Hamilton presentation method. I'll explain to you step by step how to actually structure your presentations under this method and then give you some ideas for what you can do today. Um, so with that said, I, mean, I just want to check in and make sure we're all hanging with me. I just showed you a wrestling video. I told you about yoga uh, and I told you about ring announcing. Uh, give me a Capital letter A in the chat if you're if you feel good about moving forward and if you're still hanging with me. All right, an A plus. Perfect, perfect, perfect. My Indian parents will be happy that you gave me an A plus and everyone else gave me an A. They're gonna be kind of kind of uh, unhappy about that that I didn't get the plus. All right, so um, let's talk first why presentations, okay? Um, here's the thing. Every business has three types of customers. And you can think about this as your end customers. You always think about this as your, as your partners. One group is what I call the I already get it group, okay? These are the buyers who require little to no explanation. They've already done all their research and they know exactly what they want. And by the time you come to them, they're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just show me some pricing and let's, let's move forward right? There's also what I call the I've been burned group. This is the group who has had a bad experience with a competitor of yours. And so they have a really bad taste in their mouth, but they know they could still benefit from having this type of a product or service. And so when they speak with you, like they, they still want the thing, but they've got this like tint to them where, where they've had a bad taste in their mouth. And so the negative experience they had with someone else, they kind of like project that onto you from the start because they're worried about getting screwed over again. And with that group, you're kind of in a situation where you got to just like prove to them you're not going to screw them over, give them the right pricing, et cetera. Then there's the middle group that most companies have the majority of that makes up their customer, or their partner base, which is what I call the guide me group. Okay. The guide me group are the ones who need to be educated along the way. They need their hand held along the way. They need to be taken on a journey. They are, they've heard about this thing before. Maybe they're not really sure if they should be doing something or not, but it's on their mind in some way and they need to be guided on that path. For most companies, this is your largest customer base or your largest partner base. And what you'll find is that the these are this is the group that really needs a story okay they need to have an emotional pull because they're at best they're in like the awareness stage when when you talk to them but they haven't necessarily made a decision yet they're not totally like they haven't been sold on on like your thing yet and so because they're just in that awareness stage they need something that's going to draw their interest to get them to a decision and ultimately take action the other thing I want to point out is that the I already get it and the I've been burned group, they will typically like price lock you, right? They'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah I already get it. And, and yeah, like we can move forward, but we're not willing to like agree to a payment structure that's a cent more than this, right? So they kind of like, they price lock you to their terms. And because they're ready to like sign something today, we bend to their whims pretty easily. And so that's why winning the guide me group is so important by telling the right story. I'll also say too, 
you can, if you tell the right story effectively to the I already get it or the I've been burned group, you can actually reset their expectations and open up kind of more value with them and not get price locked uh, either at all or as much as, as if you just kind of go with, um, with what they want to do and not tell the right story. And the reason why story is so important is because, I don't know if you all agree with this, but I will firmly believe product alone is not what's going to sell unless, of course, you want to be commoditized, right? We Think about how we buy a can of peas on the shelf. We look at whatever is at eye level, and we basically go for lowest price, and we, you know, we maybe have like a 20 cent variation on what we're going to pay on a can of peas. That's being commoditized down. You will get commoditized down if you solely try to win people on product. So story is what sells and what unlocks extra value. It's what creates deals for you that work not only to their favor, but to your favor in the best way possible. And I will also say this, you're not only fighting, um, you know, you're all in competitive landscapes, I would assume. You're not just fighting the fact that they might try to commoditize you down or they might try to work with a competitor. You're, you're also fighting their decision to kind of like resign entirely and opt for the status quo and do nothing. And I think that's probably one of the, that's everyone's competitor is someone's decision to just do nothing and be like, nah, you know what? We're fine right now. We can get by the way we are. And so in this partner environment, telling the right story, is what's going to move them off of status quo, because they're going to realize something about their own situation and their customer situation that they hadn't considered before. So that's why we need a story to stand out and stand apart. So what does a good presentation accomplish? Well, here's how I see it. And here's how, you know, when I've enacted this with several clients, here's what we accomplish with a good presentation. It's gonna explain your value in the context of a story. And, that's gonna, and, and that story is going to effectively communicate your unique point of view, which puts your partner in the right state of mind cutting your product demo time in half because they're in the right state and state of mind, making it easier for them to explain to their customers, which converts them into a champion of your brand. So it's like they, they're not just a partner of yours, they are a champion of yours. And they are eager to talk about you to their customers as opposed to just having it as like a, this extra tool that it's in their back pocket when the situation comes up and is convenient for them. They are actually finding ways to have that conversation with their customers because they see the value so much. And when that happens, it's gonna to lead to more higher value deals. And at the same time, it becomes the narrative that everyone gets behind. Your team, the team that you talk, the team that viewers talk to your direct customers, a team that talks to potential partners, the partners themselves, and then the end customers of those partners. Everyone gets behind a common narrative. And that so what that means is that your actual like product demo in your partner process should pretty much always be preceded by a pitch deck to be able to put them in the right state of mind. So how do you get them in the right state of mind? Well, this is where we need to all flip our mindsets and adopt what I call the mindset of think like an entertainer. Stop thinking like an executive. Stop thinking business. Instead, think like an entertainer. The reason I say think like an entertainer is because the entertainer has one goal in mind, and that is make an emotional connection with their audience. Elicit an emotional response. Get a buy-in. Right? Get an emotional buy-in. And when you think like an entertainer, you'll put yourself in an audience first mindset. So if you think about like, you know, your favorite music artist, like think about how they hit the stage. Because I want you to not only just think like an entertainer, I want you to act like you're selling out Madison Square Garden. Okay. And what I mean by that is if you take like Evan, who's, who's a music artist that you like? Eminem. Eminem. Sweet. All right. All right, so when Eminem hits the stage, here's what doesn't happen. He's not like, all right, how's everyone doing tonight? And everyone's like, yeah, we're great. Okay, great, so check it out. Like, so tonight I'm gonna go through every song in my entire catalog across all seven studio albums I've released 
not just the albums, but the mixtapes as well. I also want to take you through some working drafts I've had in the garage. I want to play all the annoying skits that are in the middle of the songs on the albums as well. And I want to show you what's on my roadmap too for the future, because all that's really important to me. I know there's a lot of songs in here that you may not vibe with, but I love it all. And I want to make sure you get all of it. It's going to take probably 21 hours to get through it all. Who's with me? Right. Even a diehard Eminem fan like you or like me, I'm a diehard Eminem fan. I'd be like, all right, yo, yo, come on, play the hits, play the songs I want to hear. And let's get it. Let's get this through because, you know, I got two hours, you got two hours of my time and I got to get home to my family and eat at some point. I can't be here all day with you. Okay. They don't bog you down with all the things that they care about. They think about, hey, how do I want people leaving this arena? Like, what do I want them buzzing about? And so they curate a set list based off that. And so what you need to do is think about, hey, what's our set list that's gonna create a specific emotional state for them? And if you were selling out Madison Square Garden yourself, would you give 20 slides about your backend technology? Or would you, would you ask yourself, all right, how do I make this an unforgettable experience for everyone? And by doing that, you're gonna look good in the process. So the, the idea here with Think Like an Entertainer is see and speak from your audience's point of view. So how do we actually then build a presentation that's going to stand out and stand apart and win over partners? Well, the way we're gonna do that is by going ham, right? I mentioned before the Hamilton musical. Now, um, can you just give me with a, if, so do this. Uh, I've got everyone's um, screen pulled up in the little Zoom boxes. Can you put up any kind of like emoji in the Zoom screen if you have either seen Hamilton or listened to the soundtrack? And if you have, if you have, are not familiar with it at all, then don't do any type of emoji. Any Evan? It's in the bar below. I don't know some people don't. It's just called. It's under reactions. A lot of people don't know that bar is there. Oh yeah, there's a reactions button where you can um, put some type of uh, emoji there. Like right next to That's... like share screen and stuff like that. All right, wait. So maybe by people who are on camera, then by nods. Have you not, are you not familiar with Hamilton at all? Or are you yes familiar with Hamilton at all? Oh my God. All right, so John, you are. Shanna and Jen, you are, oh my man. Y'all have been living under a rock for the last five, six years. Okay, so synopsis. And it's on Disney Plus now. So you've had a chance to watch this for like a year. So I'm gonna give a spoiler alert, all right? Uh, if you aren't familiar, because you know it's the hip hop musical that won like a million Tony Awards and it gained international recognition. It's also won a bunch of Grammys as well. Uh, it's a play about the life and legacy of Alexander Hamilton. Spoiler alert, he dies at the end, okay? Someone who was alive 250 years ago is now dead, big spoiler. But if you dissect the way they tell this story, you actually have the framework for the perfect presentation, okay? Because here's the thing, Hamilton dies in a pistol duel with the then vice president, Aaron Burr. And that's a pretty shocking thing to hear at face value. Hey, the vice president kills the treasury secretary. Could you imagine waking up to a news story where it's like Kamala Harris got into a pistol duel with someone in her cabinet and everyone was cool with it. And, 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 and they're just, they just replaced the cabinet member and, and everyone's, everyone's fine, right? You'd be like, wait a second, something's wrong here. That probably shouldn't be happening. But the thing is that conclusion is crazy by today's standards. But if you're in the audience watching the show, you're actually expecting it to happen and you're okay with that. And rather than leaving the theater cursing, cursing out Aaron Burr and being like, how could you have done this, you monster? How could this have happened? You actually leave the play thinking and talking about the life and legacy of Alexander Hamilton. And that's what people know the play for. And that's what the creators of the show want you to walk away believing and thinking about and talking about. So how did they do that? How did they get you to jump to that? How did they get you to that conclusion and not be like, wait, 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 this is crazy. I don't buy it. Well, it's all in the structure because if you break this play apart piece by piece, the first thing they do is give away the ending. So the curtains open and Aaron Burr walks out on stage and through song, the first lyrics he spits are, how does a bastard orphan, son of a whore, and a Scotsman dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence, impoverished in squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. 
So they basically have their thesis statement at the very beginning, which is how does someone who has every odd of life stacked against them and grows up from nothing go on to beat all the odds and become a great lasting American hero? That's what they say. We're, they basically say, this is what we're going to explore for the next three hours. We're going to prove to you that it is possible. And then one of the last lines in that first song is Aaron Burr saying out loud, I'm the damn fool that shot him. So in the first song, they give away the ending. But if you're in the theater, if you're watching it on Disney+, Plus, you're not like, oh, sweet. Yeah, I know the ending. We don't need to watch the rest of this. That's not at all what you do, because now you're actually hooked. You're like, wait a second, how, like, how does that happen? I got to know more about this. And they've drawn you in by giving away the ending from the very start. So then as the play develops, you know, this tension continues to build up between Hamilton and Burr over time. And part of how they get you to that end point of Burr being the damn fool that shot him is they very strategically have three pistol duels that take place in the show to help get us there, okay? The first pistol duel is called the 10 Dual Commandments. And what it does is it defines the world and gets you to accept the world that you've entered in that play, okay? So they told us at the beginning, Burr shoots Hamilton. Burr says that himself. But in order to make us not obsess over the murder, we have to understand what the world was like. And so through this song, the 10 Dual Commandments, they explain the whole concept of dueling culture and honor code in 1700s America. And this song covers, here's why duels exist, here's how they come together, here are the ground rules of it, et cetera, et cetera. So what they do is effectively define the world for us. And as a result, we buy into dueling culture. We have said, yes, I can get on board with the way the world works as you've presented it to me. And that's really key because we need that level of, we need that first level of buy-in for any of the rest of the play to be effective and get us to the end point that the creators want us to be. And again, I tell you, this is very strategically done because the, 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 the creator of the play, Lin-Manuel Miranda, said in an interview, the audience needs, needed to understand what dueling was like back then. This was not drive-bys. This was not heated people taking their guns outside of bars the way this wasn't beef the same way beef is today. It was super codified. There was a, a ritual about it. It was like legal, legal arbitration, but with guns. Right, and so they very strategically put that duel in at the beginning to get us to buy into the world. After we've bought into the world, we can say, okay, dueling is a thing. I can accept that. That was a part of the culture. Now they have to show us that there's emotion behind it. And so the second duel is where they communicate the impact of a duel and that potential loss can actually happen as a result. So the first duel, you know, an insignificant character gets shot. But in the second duel, a character who you are emotionally invested in gets shot and killed. And so now you say, okay, wait, this was a thing that happened, but there were some real stakes at play, even though they did happen. And, you know, there are tears in the crowd at this point. And the audience is so emotionally bought into this concept now. And so after duel two, we've emotionally bought into the impact of a duel. So duel one, we buy into the concept of a duel and the culture of it. Duel two, we, we buy into the impact of it. And what that does is perfectly tee up the third and final duel, which now feels like, as the audience, the inevitable ending. Now you're waiting for it to happen. Why? Because they've set it up properly. And because remember, the first thing they said was, uh, I, I shot him, right? That's what Burr says. The first thing Burr says is, I shot him. So because you're waiting for it to happen, you expect it to happen. You're actually kind of like happy that the ending fulfilled the beginning, like the feedback loop was completed in your mind. And instead of obsessing over murder, you and your friends leave the theater saying to yourself, man, I can't believe, like, I, I never realized Hamilton had such an impact on our modern day life. What an what a, like, amazing American hero. And guess what? The first words they say in the song, how does this guy become an American hero? And we're walking out of the theater saying, what an American hero. So they get you to the end point that we want, that they wanted us to be. We're not obsessing over murder at all. And again, this was all very, very intentional because they create, they built it around a story to get us there. And another quote from the creator, 
Every single element in the show, every moment was serving the story. The story was not a list of events on a historical timeline. It was the emotional journey that Hamilton and the other key characters needed to make. Now really think about that because list of historical events on a timeline in a business setting is the equivalent of showing you our product and all the details about our product and the terms of our partner program, right? That's not emotional. There's no story behind that. That's, that's your list of events on a historical timeline. So we have to get the characters in your show, your partners, your customers to go on an emotional journey with you if they are gonna become the champions of your brand that you want them to be. So how do we do that? Well, now I wanna walk you through what I call the Hamilton presentation method. Wanna make sure you're all hanging with me still. If so, in the chat, type in capital letter HAM, H-A-M, if you're feeling good about this and if you're ready to see the method. Hammy. <laughs> all right, you're all hanging with me. I appreciate that. So let's dive into what does this mean for your presentations? Okay, so if we take that framework and we apply it to creating a slideshow, here's what here's how it maps out. Okay, you're going to break out your presentation into four sections an introduction and then three duels. Each of these sections, your goal is to answer specific questions, which I will show over the next few slides. In total, there are 10 fundamental questions that your presentation should answer. And I just want to I want to clarify up front. I am telling you there are 10 questions your presentation needs to, your presentation needs to answer. I am not saying that you need to create a 10 slide presentation. Okay? Create a presentation that uses as many slides as you need to get the point across and not let it drone on forever, but I am firmly not saying this is a 10 slide thing. I'm saying you need to answer 10 questions across the number of slides that you put in your presentation. All right. And, I, and I'll tell you, most presentations that I work on end up being 15 to 25 slides, and they're still like deadly effective because they tell the right story and they answer these questions. So we start off with the introduction. So in this method, your introduction needs to give away the ending up front. So remember, in Hamilton, they say, how does this person grow up to be something and come from nothing? I'm the damn fool that shot him. What you want to do is talk about upfront what is the end destination for your customer? And in a partner setting, you want to talk about this in terms of the end destination for their customer, okay? You want to talk about this through the lens of how they should be rethinking what their customers are, are thinking about on a day-to-day -day basis. So when I say the destination, what I mean is what's like the end result you're able to get their customers to? And you might think this work, this would work against you because I'll talk to a lot of people building presentations. They'll be like, well, no, no, we got to build up to this big reveal. We can't tell them up front what we're going to do for them or what the value is. I like to liken it to um, kind of like if you remember when you were a kid and your parents, like you're going to go to Disney World, right? And they were like, hey, kids, get in the car. We're going to Disney World. You're like, yeah, awesome. And you're pumped the whole way. But imagine if they said, hey, kids, get in the car. We're going to drive for 17 hours and we're not telling you where we're going. You would be kicking and screaming the whole way. And I'm telling you, your partners and your own end customers are going to be internally kicking and screaming if you don't tell them up front what's in it for them. What's the end result you're striving for with them? And really treat this as beyond like a tactical ROI. Think about it. What's the end like emotional state they're going to get to? All right. Um, and then what you're able to do is basically be like, hey, that's where we want to get to. Now let's talk about how we get there. So it's almost like a Google Maps, right? Here's the destination. Now let's go back to step one on how we get to that destination. So that's your introduction. And really think about like that as like your cover slide where you talk through this. Then we get into your first duel, if you will, which is where you want to answer these three questions. What does their world look like today? So in a partner setting, what is your partner, what is their, your partner's customer, their end customer's world look like today? So you define the world and then you introduce some friction of some kind where you then talk about what market forces are changing that world, bubbling up a certain set of problems. And because of those problems, why is making a change necessary? 
The key here is you're gaining alignment on some basic truth first, and then bringing up friction or change with that basic truth. The idea behind the basic truth is you're creating an agreement up front. You're gaining a certain level of buy-in and you want to be like the, what you're doing throughout this entire process is just gaining little by little micro agreements. You're gaining buy-in little by little at a time. So by the end of the presentation, they've mentally said yes to themselves nine, 10 times. And so they feel good about moving forward because they've been saying yes to themselves and yes to you throughout the process. It's also going to make it much more easier to visualize towards your destination when you can gain agreement on what the terms of the world are today. Um, I'll tell you, the single best way to do this whenever possible to gain agreement on what on the world today and then the kind of the, the market forces that are changing things is by being able to draw an analogous scenario or paint an analogous scenario and then draw a parallel to how that relates to their business landscape. Where you're essentially saying, hey, you know how things are happening like this over here? That's actually exactly how it's working here too. You just never realized it. And this whole section, this whole duel, what you're getting them to do is say to themselves, huh, you know, I never thought of it like that before. And when they say that to themselves, they say, I never thought of it like that before. Now you're teaching them. And now they're hooked because they're like, you're getting them to realize something about their own situation that they had never considered. And they're like, oh man, if they think about it that way, I should be thinking about it that way. I, I got to hear what else they're saying, right? And so they, they're just ready to hang on your every word as a, as a result. And then that's going to tee up your second duel. So you've, you've talked about why change is necessary coming out of this part. And then your second duel is all about conveying impact. So you, you bring up, okay, hey, change is necessary. Now, what crossroads does that present for you? Think about it as like, um, you know, it's like Neo in the Matrix. There's either take the red pill or take the blue pill, right? So what is that crossroads that in a partner situation that their customers are at these days? Then after you present the crossroads, so, you know, you obviously like want them to take, what does Neo take the red pill, I think? Or does he take the, what does he take? The blue or the red pills? Anyone remember? Whatever the good pill red, is, red, 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 takes the red, red pill. Okay. Yeah. So obviously it's like, like they're going to agree that, yeah, the red pill totally makes sense for their customer base, but you want them to like vocalize that because now it's another micro agreement. And it's all, I tell you, every company that I work with, they hate, at first they hate doing this slide. They're like, ah, oh, it seems so like contrived to be like, which path do you want to take? And then they do it and they're like, oh my God, it works. Right. Because you get them to say, yeah, that does make a ton of sense. Why would I choose the alternative? Or why would my customers choose the alternative? So, and then, so they've chosen the red pill, but then you want to like pull back question six here and be like, well, let's just quickly talk about the trade-offs or loss of if they don't do anything. So they've agreed to your path forward, but you're pulling back for a moment. You'll be like, all right, I'm glad you agree with us and, and how we think about this. I just want to take a step back and just talk through what happens when they don't go this path. Because inevitably, you know, you might be talking to them and they're thinking like, uh, they're thinking, yeah, this sounds good, but then maybe something comes up and they're like, you know what, status quo is better. So you want to call out for them, what are the trade-offs of doing nothing here? What's the loss of doing nothing? And then, because those are the trade-offs, what's the positive impact of actually making a change? What I want to make clear is that throughout this entire presentation thus far, right, through, through duels one and two, you're not yet talking about your product or your service or like your, you know, your partner program offering. You're just talking about the idea of change, right? The idea of doing something about it, the idea of a better way. Because what that's going to do is perfectly set up your third and final duel, which is your inevitable ending, right? It paints you as the inevitable ending. It, it puts you in position to be the logical purveyor, the logical provider of that change to where they say, this makes so much sense and, you, and you're the ones who do it. Yeah, let's do a deal. Like we want to get this in front of our customers immediately. And so that's where you talk through like, 
the plan of attack, meaning like, what's the product? What's the partner program offering? And then you're going to repeat what destination will that bring their customers to, and then talk through credibility. This is case studies at this point. So there's no NASCAR slide up front in this format. This is at the, at the very back end, you have, it's not even a, a smattering of logos. It's you're going to put one to three valuable customer stories or partner stories that show you're not just talk, you've got some proof to back it up. Okay. And that is the Hamilton presentation method. You have the intro and you have the three duels to back it up. You answer those 10 questions across your slides and pretty much in order, right? Start with it in order. Once you have everything laid out, then you might see you, need, you might need to reshift a couple things. But I'm telling you that format works. And that's how you achieve, you know, I, went, I, I said earlier, I had that Mortal Kombat, you know, pitch deck fatality. That's how you achieve to use the Mortal Kombat video game. That's how you get flawless victory instead, right? And if you do this well, if you execute this well, your partners will want to do business with you, not only because your product or your service offering is good, but because they recognize you as experts in the field and they see themselves how they can come off as experts to their end customers. Because you're going to tell them as well, hey, you can use this exact presentation when you're talking to, to your customers. And, it's a and you'll be able to train them up on essentially telling their customers the same story. And so they're gonna be able to say to themselves, wow, we're gonna come off looking really good to our customers if we talk to them like this. Rajiv, I got a question for you. Um, yeah. So on that point, I think a lot of people do that already in the sense like they'll have a deck and they'll just like repackage it and they're like, hey, use this deck when talking to customers. Where I think they fail to do is like, you know, assume there's that partner is not just selling you, right? I mean, depending if it's a Salesforce partner, sure enough, they might be just selling, you know, Salesforce licenses or whatever. But like most people, they're working with, you know, agencies and other, you know, consultancies. They're, they're lit. You're just part of the equation, right? So to give them a, you could either give them a, just a deck and say, hey, do your deck and then do our deck, which, you know, is kind of messy, may work. I don't know. Or you design the deck in a way that's like, hey, start off with this. This is where your services live. Add three slides here, then go to this and then close it with your services. So assume they're going to change it. So give them yeah. the best place to do it. And that just says like, hey, like we're not just handing off this thing to you to use as we use it. We recognize that you have your thing and we want to make you successful with your services and we want this to add to your, like, there's so much level of trust that's being done just by doing that, but it actually helps you because then they're not butchering something you've already created. You're, you're kind of planning for it. Can for you comment sure. on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, I think, so if we go back to this part here, number eight, the plan of attack, specifically in a partner setting, what you want to do here when it's not just you talking about your product, it's you being able to say, to have it echo kind of your words there. Well, so you like, here's where your product lives in that whole story we've just talked about. And here's how we complement that. And so then they're like, oh my God, this is a, like, this fits in so perfectly. And then kind of, as you said, you can, you can talk them through like, and you can take them through this story and show them how like, like your integration point and, and then how, and how this offering tacks on perfectly to it. Yeah, I mean, that story kind of organically has to exist. Otherwise, they wouldn't be a partner, right? Like they're clearly saw a fit or a synergy. And it's usually not commission. It's usually like, hey, this is going to sell, help sell our services, or this is going to help us sell the whole tech stack or whatever it is. So it's clearly already synergy. You just need to flush that out and create it into a story that makes sense. So you can actually tell it without having to flush it out with the customer. You shouldn't have to flush it out with the customer. You should just be able to, like you said, guide them through it. That's already... Sorry, that. Yeah. Yeah. And remember, right, this is what's going to help get them excited. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges in selling to partners is sustaining the momentum to get them to actually like do something about it. Right. I think there's a lot of, yeah, okay, like let's like we'll keep it in mind. Right. But you want them to really be like, we got to get this in front of our customers ASAP. Right. They got to, again, it's, it's about 
turning them not just into partners, but into champions of your brand. And again, I say this method works really well. And I just want to um, highlight a couple of our own success stories, building out presentations under this format with some other customers where we had the VP of marketing at Search Spring being like, oh my God, this tells the story we've been trying to figure out for years. We built a presentation mod off that exact model. And she was like, I'm seriously submitting this for awards. Now, this was to their end customers directly from their sales team, but I'll tell you, their sales team, since we instituted this, has been consistently doing 125, 150%, up to 200% of quota, which I know sounds ridiculous. And quite honestly, even when I heard like 200%, I was like, are you kidding me? No way. And then they showed me the numbers and they were like, holy crap. It, I was like, holy crap, they are actually doing like overperforming that well. Or uh, Rohan is the CEO of this company, Avana, out of Australia, where they went to the largest health insurer in Australia. And they went to them with a, a partner white label opportunity. And the CEO left that meeting saying, this is great. You really understand our business and where we're trying to go with our customers. And they, they walked out with a letter of intent from them. Right. So that's why, that's why I get so like bullish on teaching this methodology because I'm telling you it works if you follow that method and you execute it well, right? You got to deliver emotion and tell a good story in the process. So a couple parting shots that I have for you, um, just kind of to summarize everything. Most presentations are dry, they're self-centered and they miss the point. They are capabilities decks. I want you to like eradicate that from your lingo if your company starts saying we need a capabilities deck. No, you don't. A capabilities deck is what commoditizes you. It's what gets you ignored easily. What you need is a narrative-driven presentation. So to do that, start by with the mindset, right? Think like an entertainer so you can build curiosity and sustain interest. And then tee up your product demo with that compelling presentation and use the Hamilton presentation method where you give away the ending up front in your introduction and then you use the three duels to get them to that end emotional state where that you want them to be at. And you do that and that's gonna, that's gonna help you stand out. And again, turn your partners into brand champions. So that is my presentation for y'all today. Um, real quick, I think what a good, um, a good resource if you're looking for design inspiration. So our designer at Startup Hype Man um, keeps a Instagram and Pinterest account called The Good Deck, at The Good Deck. I'll put it in the chat here. Um, it's a really helpful, uh, again, Instagram account and Pinterest account where what she does is she just like publishes slides different companies have used. So you can see like how they designed it. And then she kind of like analyzes like why something is a different certain color scheme or why imagery is put on there in a certain way. Um, and then if you want, you know, my contact information, oops, here it is for you. Um, there's my email and, I, and, I, and I'm in the, uh, the Slack channel as well. So if you want to DM me any follow-up questions that you have, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, and connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, just so you know, on LinkedIn, my, my account is like a, a creator account or like an influencer account or something like that. So you'll have to like, there's like a dot, dot, dot button that allows you to connect instead of oh, the default. Follow, be like, yeah. follow Yeah, it'll be like follow instead of connect. So just hit the dot, dot, dot. So influencer. Nice. Um, awesome. Well, we got a few, that's, that was awesome. I think there's, I mean, we got a few um, minutes here. If anybody has any um, questions around like, you know, specifically if there's a challenge or an issue that you're going with, um, going through right now, um, yeah. might be able to right just slide into that. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Go ahead, Shana. Oh, is it Shana or Shana? Shana. Shana. I've heard every single pronunciation under the sun, so you can, <laughs> you can hit me with whatever. Um, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the use of, um, multimedia in presentations, you know, are you using videos or GIFs or anything? And, and how often do you sprinkle them in to just keep the audience engaged? Great question. So use them tastefully. Um, if you're trying to make, if, if it's a slide, people are going to sit on for a while. A, a, a GIF is going to just distract them because it's, it's on loop, right? It keeps playing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Like 
I used, I think, one GIF in this, and it was the background of that Mortal Kombat slide. But all I was doing there on that slide was being like, it looked like this. And I just literally talked about exactly what was in the background of the slide. And it was like, I wasn't delivering pertinent, like, in, I wasn't pertinent strategic information on that slide. So like, yes, use it if it, if design wise, it looks well. And if it's more to like create like a punchy impact statement, as opposed to like some like key, like teachable moment. Um, videos, the biggest challenge I see when I've, I've seen present uh, videos used in presentations and this, a lot of companies hate hearing this, but a lot of the videos companies have are just like boring. <laughs> You know, it's like that, like kind of like drive by, like product overview video with like the scripted music that, you know, you pick out of like stockmusic.com. Um, and it's got these like graphics that it's like actionable insights, data driven, right? All that stuff. Like no one was going to sit and watch that and be like, wow, I am thoroughly impressed. Or the video is like underproduced, you know, and it's like some, it's like a voice, it's a screen share recording of someone with a bad microphone in an echoey room demoing the product for 60 seconds so the video has got to be something that actually like, kind of like you know again is tasteful and can get someone to be like all right i see the point now i recommend for video if anything um use it to help illustrate a point about the situation so and again this is a webinar it wasn't a sales offering today but you know, I use that video up front with the wrestler as a funny way to be like, this is what presentations sound like, right? And it's just kind of like a funny way to like laugh and like start to like introduce the point and, and get to things. Um, if, you, I mean, if you have your own like videos you're using internally that like your company has made, um, I think the best place to use a video is showing a like customer story or a success story. But what I would really focus on in the customer talking about like their success or the partner talking about their success is in that interview that you've had with them when they were filming is can you get them to talk about like what are the common objections or what are the things they thought about wouldn't work and then they're like you know and like to be honest I really was like yeah there's no way it's gonna end up working or or I had my reservations about this this and this but it was actually like quite surprising and refreshing that they actually did accomplish these three things so it's not just them being like, they're the best. It's amazing. You got to do business with them. It's like a more like realistic way they would talk about it conversationally is the video. Uh, I hope that helps. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, any other final questions here? And I know a couple of you already jumped off, which is totally cool. Yeah, we're going to jump off. Any other questions? Nice. I just think it's like that creating that state of mind is so important, right? Like it's the same thing when you walk into a sales meeting, like you want to, you know, it's like breaking the ice or, you know, chatting about random things. It's like, you're trying to get them like comfortable in talking to you for the next 15, 20 minutes, but people miss that in presentations all the time. They're just like, just get right into it. Like, let me get into yeah. the slides. It's like, well, no, like get them comfortable. Right. And it's like, yeah. But you're, you're talking about like more like get them an actual state of mind, like show them image, like advertising, show them imagery, video, whatever it is to get them to like on that level that you're at versus like, like when we opened this up, I, you know, um, what was the guy named, uh, his last name was Pitcher. Like I was thinking about Pitcher five o'clock, you're thinking Pitcher baseball, like we weren't on the same. Yeah, yeah. We needed, like <laughs> if we had talked about baseball for a split second before that. I would have been on your level. So it's like, right. it's really getting them to that step. Like, so everybody's thinking about the same things, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, visually, and, I, and for everyone who's live, again, you can reach out to me on Slack and I've got a ton of experience in this. So if you want my help building something out, of course, reach out. But, you know, I was, I was, I started working with a new client um, yesterday or this past week, and I was doing an audit of their current demo process. And I looked at their, their existing slides. And I showed them how on one slide, they had so much information on it. There was 29 different places my eyes could go. And I'm like, you know, so when you think about the visuals of your slides, you've got to pare it down. You may have heard that acronym OTPS, one thought per slide, um, not one time password as Amazon or any of those you know, uh, logistics companies will, will send you through text. Um, 
like you got to pare down the information per slide because if I have 29 different areas my attention could go on a single slide, one, there's no chance I'm going to actually consume all of it. And two, there's no chance I'm actually listening to what you're saying because I like at a biological level, the brain cannot both listen and read at the same time. And it's going to opt for read and it's going to try and read everything possible and hear nothing about what you're saying. Yeah, nailed it. All right, um, Rajiv's on the um, on the uh, executive's channel as well as the CSA general channel. If you have any questions, uh, hit him up. Uh, but thank you for joining me, and, and Rajiv, thanks a lot for a great presentation. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all. Go kill it, man. Right. Thank you, Here you guys. Take bye, care, bye, everyone.